Hi, my name is Ben Blythe. I'm an instructor over at Phoenix Society of Historical Swordsmanship. And hi, I'm Elizabeth. I am a senior instructional designer and Quality Matters instructor uh, at Arizona State University. Yeah, and over the last few months, um, I've been developing a course for Armored Combat. You may have seen some of my videos as we do like a week-by-week -week review. Um, but honestly, my lovely wife was very helpful in encouraging me to include learning objectives, knowledge checks, and lesson plans for this entire 17-week course. Uh, why is that? Why are those helpful and why is that important for any kind of educational program? I was going to say, first of all, I forgot to say that my credentials are wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, why are uh, structured lesson plans and learning objectives important? Um, learning objectives from a course and a module level are important because it allows you to track progress and not just track it, but also scaffold it. With a clear, measurable learning objective, you are able to systematically put in place um, spaces to check knowledge and check success of reaching those goals whenever you have a course. Um, I do this with your more traditional academic classes, but this applies for any class you'd ever teach, sewing, sword fighting, English 101. Um, and having periodic knowledge checks is an important way to communicate to your students how they're doing um, and ensure that they're getting timely and effective feedback. I think, that's, I think that's really important. Timely and effective feedback and measurable feedback is something you talk about quite a bit. Um, why? This seems like a lot for an enthusiast thing. You mentioned teaching a sewing class and using lesson plans and knowledge checks, but like, is are these helpful even when it's just like hobbies or enthusiast stuff? Is this is this too much? I don't think so. I think any time that you're setting a goal for yourself, um, it should be a smart goal, specific, measurable, timely, all those good things. Um, and with a, a hobby of any sorts, you're not going to be 100% perfect the very first time you do this. And having targeted points where you have an opportunity to check your growth is really important and an opportunity to reflect back on how far you've come um, and to see how you've been building on your previous knowledge and skills um, and a way for you to check where you're going. Yeah, that's one of the most satisfying pieces of this class and, and some of the best help you gave me, Liz, was the fact that I can now look at my students week over week and my friends, right, and see them improve as we go along this course. If someone wanted to get started and doesn't have access to a wife who works for ASEO um, by making learning objectives and lesson plans, are there any like public resources or places that people can go to find sort of an outline for this stuff? Yeah, there's a bunch of things that you can check out. Um, you can always just look up instructional design in general. You'll find a lot of great resources. Um, Vanderbilt University has a really great uh, learning objective builder based on the Bloom's taxonomies. Um, Quality Matters has a lot of free um, and publicly available information about their uh, higher education and K-12 through rubrics that can be amended for literally any type of learning that you're doing. Um, the thing that I recommend is backwards design where you mm. start with what is your end goal, where do you want your students to end up, um, what should that look like, and then work your way backwards to um, meet them where they're at, where they're starting. So if you're working on um, improving to a more advanced skill and you have a brand new set of students, you're going to want to work your way back from the high level skills to those low level <laughs> skills. But um, that doesn't mean that you can't meet your students where they're at. So if you have some students who are already a little bit experienced, you can kind of put them further along on that track and meet them at a mid-level objective. We, You gave me some good advice of incorporating those advanced students as kind of instructors. Right, we were able to incorporate uh, some of those advanced students that teach uh, skills you picked up helping me with armored combat, which is kit repair, um, armor repair, armor care, things along those lines. Um, you actually had me backtrack into this. My goal was to have my my friends and my students participate in an SCA event uh, as well as Combat Con in Las Vegas and the armored combat there. And this was a term I'd never heard, which was blooms. Hierarchy of learning. Yeah. Did I get that right? Things taxonomy or hierarchy of uh, knowledge skills. That's it. And then that helped me sort of clarify my learning objectives. So as someone who's never done this before uh, and hasn't really gone to a lot of college, I would start there. I love that idea of like starting with this is where we want to go. 
and then using blooms to kind of work your way back and develop that plan. Yeah, it's a little bit of a pyramid, although I like to think about it more of like an escalator. So you mm. can get on that escalator wherever you want and get off wherever you want. You're not necessarily always going to start a class um, in the pyramid. The very first level is understand and the last level is create, which is um, creating brand new uh, pieces or knowledge or something totally new. Um, based off of the knowledge you've gained from those lower levels. Um, but you can get off at the apply stage, or you can get on at the apply stage and get off at the create stage. So there's a lot of options mm -hmm. and flexibility for how you plan your lessons. Um, and I want to come back to something you said about your more experienced students teaching others. Um, something that we know is an effective um, approach for teaching students is um, having students teach others. Um, it's one thing to be spoken at, but when you get to actually go to that apply stage and apply it yourself and try to teach it to somebody else, um, I would almost call that peer review for your course. You're getting a little <laughs> bit of peer review and it really helps your students um, who are at that higher level cement their understanding in a new way while also helping somebody else. Richard's actually a big um, proponent of that at the Phoenix Society. Of how do we take people and move them into an instructor? And that helps foster solid community. Um, you see this with your class discussion boards that you, you moderate and things along those lines. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to cement skills and it's a great way to get them moving into their own create stage where they can kind of start creating their own ways to approach lessons and discover new ways to communicate to somebody. Um, because you teach one way and they learn one way, they might find a unique approach to re-explain something if how you're talking about something doesn't click with somebody else, um, we're all coming from like a shared um, knowledge and um, vocabulary, but sometimes we're not always using the, speaking the same language. Modes of learning you described. I've learned yes. so much good <laughs> vocabulary uh, by doing this and it's been so, so laid back. So I definitely uh, do recommend uh, all of my budding HEMA instructors, uh, arts and science instructors for our SCA friends, uh, consider a lesson plan, consider learning objectives, and uh, if people wanted to reach you on uh, social media, you just you have a really good handle. You're just at Elizabeth Christina Lee, right? Uh, at Elizabeth Christina. Yeah. Off the Lee. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I wanted to do a quick review of everything that we've been talking about so far and show you some actual examples of students. At the beginning of this class, I encourage students to just goof around. We discussed the differences between folk wrestling and modern wrestling and also did some brief falling exercises to make sure people stayed safe. And then I just turned them loose. This was part of the plan in order to try to get people further up along that escalator and Bloom's taxonomy that Lizzie mentioned. As you can see here, this is the first week and there's not a lot going on. Uh, Sean and Jacob are just kind of grabbing at each other's armor and spinning. There's an awful lot of spinning that takes place. By the end of it, they've just kind of tuckered each other out. There's no real technique here, but afterwards we were able to have a great discussion about what makes good wrestling. Here we see Sam and Johan getting uh, some experience wrestling. And again, this is week one and it's the same thing. They're just grabbing at each other's breastplates. There's some few little pieces of arm work going on. These guys are familiar with Fiori, which we're discussing in this lesson. But by and large, again, it's just that same spinning, grappling, and going for the chest piece. In fact, eventually Sam breaks loose here and just starts grabbing at Johan's chest piece, and they go for Sam actually breaks the straps of Johan's chest piece, but by working backwards when developing this education plan, we've allowed time to teach about repairs and some leatherworking and riveting. By week two, I was really excited to see students using some of the guards that we had talked. Sean on the left is an iron door, and you're going to see Abraham move to a longa guard in order to try to overcome that very defensive position. These guys are now playing on the outside, trying to get locks and work with the head instead of just grabbing the breastplate and going for a spin. Abraham does a great outside catch, and he's already trying to push Sean away, but Sean's able to overpower him. Again, this is no longer just the spinning we saw in week one. This is real progress. In fact, in this clip here, we see Sam and Kira fighting, and Sam's going to sort of revolt or go back to his old tricks. He's going to try to spin Kira, but what we're going to notice is she counters the spin and pushes him against the wall. Right there.
At this point, most of the spinning has stopped and students are using actual historical guards. They're attacking the face and breaking binds, just as Fiori expected. They're also optimizing their kit. Jacob has chosen to armor down while Jim has chosen to armor up. In this play, Jacob receives Jim's attack, but then counters and attacks the face, pushing Jim back and out of the ring, almost exactly like you see in the manuals. Let's take a look at that again. Nice. Ring out, ring out, ring out, ring out. Good one, good one, good one. Uh, this has been an overview of why you should use lesson plans in your HEMA classes. Learning objectives create clear goals for your students, and knowledge checks help them measure that. It's also very satisfying as a teacher, watching my friends and students progress and get better and better and better at the things we're discussing week after week. My name's Ben Blythe. I'm with the Phoenix Society of Historical Swordsmanship. And again, I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Elizabeth, who works for Arizona State University. Course materials, links, public resources, even my whole armored combat class will be publicly available in the description of this video. Thank you so much.